Hi there. Welcome to Fuds on Film. Gather round while we spout absolute and ill-informed nonsense about the stuff that we just happened to have seen this week. I am Drew Tavendale. With me, Mr. Scott Morris. Hello. And we're going to just get straight into things with yet another sequel based on a theme park ride. Because why not? Yes, Pirates of the Caribbean, Salad Bar's Revenge, or Dead Men Don't Wear Played, as I believe it's known in most other territories. It's presumably still fashionable, as it has been since before the first of these films, to bash Pirates of the Caribbean simply for existing. I, however, will not, since we're not exactly deluged with these films in this coming, uh, what, six years after whatever the last one was. And Is it really six years? <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the last one was the one with Ian McShane, wasn't yeah. it? Was- Blackbeard, although I can't yeah. remember if that was the name of the film or not. Yeah. And Stranger Tides? Yeah. And I don't know, the, the names are kind of meaningless. Yeah, and it's not like we're exactly deluged with these. You know, cinema has not otherwise delivered a great deal of 18th century swashbuckling fare, so I'm more than happy to take these films as a welcome change of pace from the high-tech gadgetry and nonsense that other Disney live-action studios are bringing to us. Pirates are very much out of favour compared to superheroes, so yes, it's not like it's something we're getting sick of seeing. Yes, what I cannot claim, as you've kind of alluded to there, is that whatever that last film was called, or to be honest, any of the Pirates of the Caribbean films are particularly memorable. So quite why at the start of this, the Black Pearl is in a tiny little bottle, or why Orlando Bloom's Will Turner is cursed to an eternity on the erroneously named Flying Dutchman, which sails, was something I had to go and Google, or alternatively not bother about and just accept at face value because, well, it's a Pirates of the Caribbean film and therefore not much worth expending the effort of thought on. Uh, So, while the current fate of the peril is causing Jack Sparrow, Johnny Depp of course, to hit the bottle, well, more so than usual. It's Will's fate that's driving this plot, as his son Henry, played by Brenton Thwaites, searches desperately to find a way to uncurse his father. Sparrow's given some motivation to act when a bank heist goes awry, leading to the remnants of his crew deserting him. Broke, he trades in his magic compass doodad thingy for a bottle of rum, which has the side effect of breaking yet another of the many curses that afflicted this time period. This reckless act has allowed Jack's very first nemesis, so crucial to Sparrow's character development that he's not to be mentioned until the fifth film, Spanish Navy pirate hunter Captain Saladbar, played by Javi Bar Bardem, to be released from the Devil's Triangle, now as a spooky ghost. He's resuming his endeavour to... Is the ghost played by Jeremy Irons in Die Hard 3? <laughs> Sadly. That's what that sounded like. <laughs> Sadly, no. He's resuming his mission to rid the seas of all pirates, not just Jack, but the current VP of Oceanic Piracy Endeavours, Captain Hector Barbosa, Geoffrey Rush, whose pirate fleet is now being rent asunder by Salad Bar. Mixed up in all of this is Caius Godelero's Karina Smith, a scientist following a map left by her father that's put her on the same path as Turner Jr., which, through various machinations not really worth getting into, has all of the aforementioned teaming up to seek an artefact, Poseidon's Trident, which supposedly has the power to banish all curses, which would mean the end of Salad Bar's reign of terror and the return to the world for Will Turner. So, like all the other films, it's a plot that's largely cobbled together around the set pieces, rather than anything particularly cogent of itself. Unfortunately, that's rather the standard all of today's blockbusters are at, and with very little of these monstrous budgets being funnelled into the screenwriting, it would seem. But, like pretty much everything you'd care to say about Salad Bar's Revenge, It is now as it has always been, so throwing too much shade at it for doing exactly as you'd expect it to do seems like a bit of a waste of effort. More transparently than most, perhaps, but like nigh on every tentpole release these days, this film is a spectacle delivery vector first, foremost, and nigh on only. Viewed in these terms, it does quite well, with some quite lovely effects work from the large-scale battles to the smaller-scale effects used on the likes of Bardem's hair, which floats around as though he's still underwater and it's actually quite a nice little effect. The action itself is relatively well handled, if not spectacularly so, and I'm sure for most that's enough to call it a minor success and file it away with the rest of the series in whatever part of your brain movies go to be swiftly forgotten. It would, however, be remiss of us not to point out that it suffers from a number of flaws, even if, again, it's mostly the same flaws as the rest of the series. Depp's Keith Richard axe returns, although it's perhaps a little bit more subdued here, with Sparrow more than ever seeming more like a passenger than a protagonist, which means that, rather like the first, more of the actual driving of events must come from Scodelario, who is perfectly fine, and Brenton Thwaites, who is not. Last we heard of young Thwaites was him stinking up the joint in Gods of Egypt, and he's just as much of a Quadian non-entity here, which, given that he's supposed to be Orlando's Bloom's son, might be a solid piece of casting, 
but it's still harmful to the film as it stands. The best I can say about his charisma-free performance is that, well, given the sort of film he's in, his performance, either good or bad, is not really all that important to the overall film. To balance that out, along with Depp's decent turn, although he's getting too old for the shtick, is a much more engaging support from Javier Bardem and Joffrey Rush, and the always dependable Kevin McNally. And, well, so it goes. There's a bunch of minor things that annoy me that I could dribble on for some time about, particularly Paul McCartney's eye-rolling cameo as Sparrow's uncle, but it's not Ooh, really worth anyone's painful. time. Yeah, it's a, it's a depressing minute, but it's only a minute. By this point in time, you'll know if you're in the market for another Pirates of the Caribbean film or not, and as someone who was, it was perhaps a marginally disappointing, but largely as expected way to pass a couple of hours. Now, there is something about films such as this where, when I'm not all that bothered one way or the other, it does lend to me writing rather more negatively about them than I necessarily feel, just to spice up the podcast a little bit, and I think I've fallen foul of that here. Pirates 5 was okay, but in a world where much better films than okay exist, it's very hard to get all that excited about it, so... Yeah, take that for what it's worth. Presumably by this point, know what you're getting into with the Pirates of the Caribbean film, and yes, it delivers more or less what you'd expect. I haven't seen this one yet. The films do seem to more or less run together for me. Yeah, um, I mean, I know it's been a long time, I've never really went back and watched any of them at all, really. Yeah. But I, I cannot tell you what happened in one, two, or three, apart from there's ships and there was a crack in it at some point. Yes. <laughs> um, I do remember clearly that because the second and third films were made back to back I think and came out maybe just six months apart yeah. and the, the second one really stood out because it really wasn't funny <laughs> and then the third yeah. one was just as funny as the original had been and how they managed to shoot the two films at the same time and then completely missed the mark so much in one was a puzzlement <laughs> to me but as for the actual events I don't know I mean I, I remember um, sort of like a dream sequence with crabs which I think was the start of the third film but yeah. I remember bits and pieces of things that happened and characters like um, Davy Jones which you can't forget because it's Bill Nye and therefore awful um, which I mean, it fits in with people who you describe as Quadian or Orlando Loom but so you remember those but not really what they were doing why or when Hmm. Uh, Chow Yun Fat was in one of them <laughs> at some point for some reason. But yeah, I, I actually miss. I would love to see more films, not necessarily Pirates of the Caribbean, but there's a whole raft of uh, pirate based adventures that you could have these days with the budgets and the CG capacity that we've got now, which just hasn't happened. And I would like to see something a bit more you know, impressive done with that because mm. I've, I've really got a soft spot for like, naval battles in particular. I might be one of the few people that really like Master and Commander. Um, I was going to say, um, <laughs> I didn't like Master and Commander that much because it stopped for an hour while they wandered across the Galapagos Islands. That's true, yeah. <laughs> but the act, yes, the actual naval combat was was pretty gritty and yeah. really quite compelling. So there is something to that, yes. The whole naval thing is very much underexplored and it's made for tension. You've got these ships that you've got all the tactics of it and the battles and the chases and they're very much away from home base or <laughs> you're on your yeah. own that kind of thing it's the, there's a lot of tension could be mined there but um apparently not everyone's more concerned with flying metal yes. suits it wouldn't even need to be fictional because I, i'm honestly quite surprised that there hasn't been some sort of large-scale trafalgar film or something like that yeah yeah that would be quite easy you could start off with the battle of copenhagen and touching the battle of the nile and stuff and then you end up with trafalgar and so historical changing the course of the history of Europe and therefore that's got a knock-on effect on history of the world. Yeah. You've got a legitimate, genuine, worldwide recognised hero in Nelson. Mm -hmm. You've got the worldwide recognised villain in Napoleon. Obviously he wasn't on the seas, but it's Napoleon's army, Napoleon's yeah. navy. And then several large-scale naval battles and all the tactics and things that went in with it. So it's kind of strange that something like that, yeah. <laughs> and rather maybe the the relative failure of Master and Commander put the kibosh in that. I don't know, but I'm surprised there hasn't been something like that. Like, because they would be able to do that sort of scale, yeah, much more easily now because of the advancement of computer graphic. Yeah, it would no longer be like ten model ships in a bath. Yeah, you could, you could do it properly now, but. Yeah, yeah you could, you use like physical effects for the close-up work and have a decent set of them like that actually was in the water, portions of a ship, and then you could use CGI for the expansive shots and the wide shots and things and for the scale. Mm. And do a, I think you could do a pretty good job of it. And yes, it's probably not going to be particularly accurate to history as these things never really are. But it, something like that, I thought would have thought that would actually have quite a lot of appeal. Yeah. Strange. Why do they never listen to us, Drew? We keep pitching these things. And no one ever listens. People are idiots, Scott, is the conclusion I come to every single day. <laughs>
And you mentioned pirates too, and because I'm so fond of them, then I am probably glad. But I'd just like to go like to the other end of things, and maybe closer to the pirates of the Caribbean, closer to the pirates of the Caribbean's end of the scale. But something like a Secret of Monkey Island film. Hmm. I'm honestly surprised something doesn't exist that, if not exactly that, something like that. Yeah, um, and because pirates are so popular. And you have, I mean, they're nonsense things, obviously, but you have things like, you know, National Talk Like a Pirate Day and stuff, and people still like pirates, but... And there's that new pirate-based game that was at the Microsoft E3 conference this week. Mm -hmm. So pirates still pop up every now and then. It's just strange that it's not more commonly on the screen. Mm -hmm. Yes. More pirates. That's our prescription for Hollywood. Not fit into a pirate film as well. Mm. (laughs) I can't remember what they were. Such is my mind. I, might, uh, I remember that we discussed that all films should have these two elements, but I've forgotten what they are. Sharks? It's probably sharks. Possibly. Okay, so from pirates, we move on to vegetables. Well, sort of. If you were to imagine a like animation written and directed by Ken Loach, then I think you might come quite close to the melancholy but rewarding Ma vie de courgette, My Life as a Courgette. A Swiss French stop motion animation based on Gilles Paris' 2002 book Autobiographie d'une Courgette. From the first moments, we know this isn't going to be a knockabout throwaway children's fair. Nine year old Icar, who prefers Courgette, the name by which his mother usually calls him, moves to his house, collecting the empty beer cans strewn about, while his alcoholic mother shouts at the liars on TV. Retreating to his attic bedroom, he builds a tower from the beer cans until the noise of their accidental collapse attracts his mother's ire. As she angrily ascends the stairs, a frightened courgette closes the trapdoor, causing his mother to fall to her death. It's not exactly a laugh riot. A kindly police officer takes courgette's details and then delivers him to a children's home, where he meets other unfortunate children who, like him, feel that they no longer have anyone left to love them. Amongst these children are the bully Simon, whose conspicuous scar immediately suggests that there is more to him than simply being a bully, Timid Ahmed, Damaged Alice, and Jujube with the strange eating habits. We find out why each of these children are in this home. Parental murder, deportation, drugs, crime, and the type of thing that causes one of the children to have nightmares every night. Courgette eventually settles into the home, but his world is turned upside down by the arrival of Camille, a girl with whom he is immediately smitten. Through their classes, trips and other adventures, Courgette, Camille and the others learn more about themselves and the availability and multifaceted nature of love that they have previously been denied. Debut director Claude Barat's style is simple and stylistic, his characters recalling Miyazaki heroines with their hugely expressive yet plainly rendered faces and enormous eyes that pull off the nifty trick of giving souls to lumps of plasticine. The scenes are sparsely decorated, and this does double duty in both mirroring the relative emptiness and isolation of these children's lives, and forcing us to notice the subtle expressions on their faces. At times, the style may be a little too simplistic, but any deficiencies are more than made up for by girlhood scribe Celine Siama's script. So many stories set in children's homes are horror stories of one kind or another. And in these cynical times, it is wholly refreshing to see that this is a wholesome and caring place. The social workers are kindly and caring, and Officer Raymond, a generous and decent man, rather than the villainous or uncaring archetypes so often seen in this setting. On a side note, I watched the French version, but in the English dub, Raymond is voiced by Nick Offerman, the great Ron Swanson, which seems a particularly inspired bit of casting. For all of the horrible things that have happened in the children's lives, this is a joyful and uplifting film. It allows the children, both as characters and as audience, considerably more emotional maturity and resilience than they are normally considered to have. It is dark, necessarily, but honest and real, mixing the tragedies, fears and difficulties of these young people with deeply funny moments, such as how they imagine sex to work. It's not for the very youngest of children, but otherwise something that can, and should, be seen by all ages. It acknowledges the dark things in this world, but does so in a way that refuses to simply portray the children as victims. It is smart, humane, touching, 
and celebrates the joy that children can find, even in difficult circumstances, and their ability to survive and to thrive, all without needing to ladle on the sympathy. I really like this. I had no expectations or knowledge indeed about what it was until you said, I've seen this for the podcast, maybe you should watch it. So I did, and it was very good. So thank you. <laughs> I don't have a lot more to say about it than that, but I agree with pretty much everything you're saying. It looks looks lovely. I love the style of this film. It is, you say, very well written. And Girlhood's another film that's on my several thousand long list of films that I must get round to watching at some point, but haven't quite made it. And yes, it's just an exceptionally nice little story. I, I do wonder if kids below, I don't know, 12 will get anything from it. The story's maybe a bit subtle for them, but minor quibbles like that aside, it's really, really good, and I hugely enjoyed it. But I don't have anything else or anything particularly profound to say about it. It's just a really nice story and just the beautiful style that it's got to it. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. closest I've seen to kind of Coraline, something that deals with something, yeah. you know, fairly adult while at the same time still being accessible-ish to kids. Yeah, Coraline is a good touch on it, and it's why I mentioned like at mm-hmm. the start too. Coraline is darker, but in a more fantastical way. This yeah. is more grounded reality, but then I suppose that makes the the issues that this touches on, they are really the dark things. Yeah. Although the film itself is lighter. And it is actually a really light film. It's very nicely shot. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the, not so much the tone of the events, but the way the characters are portrayed, there is definitely, there's a light to it and it just, there's light in the, really good use of light in the film as well. Yeah. And again, to go back to Coraline, like in general, but particularly Coraline, something that all three of us at Fudge and Film were always very, very fond of, that film. And it does that thing, and I will talk about this again and again, because it's <laughs> still a problem, but it allow, it's a children's film that allows moments of peace. Hmm. It allows tranquility. Again, like as Kubo from last year was the same. There's so many... Mainstream possibly is the word, but so many animations for children are just thousand miles per hour. Yeah. They just they never stop and they're so busy on screen and it's just it's visually exhausting and mentally exhausting for an adult. So for a child, I don't know um how they can take that all in. Yeah. But this is a film that's just quiet and contemplative. Um and really I you said under twelve year olds, Scott, I genuinely possible for for much younger children to appreciate I'm not talking toddlers or anything by any means but I think maybe once you've started primary school that sort of age I think there's something in here they maybe not understand everything but I really do think it credits its um, audience as well as its characters as I said with a lot more intelligence than they're normally credited with Mm -hmm. you know it's not just a silly animation full of fart jokes and things and there's a place for fart jokes don't get me wrong okay there's not necessarily anything wrong with them per se, but it seems to be like, oh, well, for so many films, it's, oh, that's the sort of nonsense we'll give kids. That Minions crap is full of that sort of stuff. Whereas this is it's thoughtful and it's like, it's not something that a child's going to stick on and watch and repeat no. 2,000, 200 times a year. Yes. Uh, it's lacking in catchy musical numbers, isn't it? Yes. It's not going to go into heavy rotation, but <laughs> just to, for something to kind of expand cinematic horizons of a child that it's lovely and again it's something that adults can very much enjoy as well yeah indeed indeed so so wonder woman yes. really love the score of that film the main theme anyway yes yeah. so we have talked about a quiet contemplative film we will move on then to pretty much the exact opposite of that which is the current big thing in multiplexes scott wonder woman it's so hot right now. Yeah, what I've been thinking that cinema needs right now is more comic book superhero films. We're almost down to 15 a year at this point. So it's nice to see DC step up to the plate and offer this origin story for Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman, who you may remember from last year's Batman vs Superman. This takes us back to the ever-increasingly misnamed War to End All Wars, towards the tail end of it, if American spy Steve Trevor Bob Dave is to be believed, played by one of the many interchangeable Hollywood Chrises. Probably Evans, maybe? Who can keep them straight? We find this out after he's been pulled from the wreckage of his plane by the then simply named Diana, who is of course Wonder Woman later on, uh, off the coast of the hidden island of something I can't pronounce, Thermiscria, probably? With a shower of krauts in hot pursuit. 
Unfortunately for the Germans, said island is home to a race of Amazonian warrior women, Zeus's army in a battle against the troublesome God of War Ares, and Fritz and co were swiftly dealt with. With the lasso of truth, Diana compels Steve Trevor Bill Collin to tell all about his mission, thus dropping a big old bucket of exposition on things. With the war seemingly lost, German General Ludendorff, played by Danny Houston, is rolling the dice on a desperate push from his only remaining weapons facility and a deadly new form of mustard gas that Dr. Maru, Elenia Anya, has created. Well, deadlier than your common mustard gas, which was already doing quite well in the deadly stakes, as far as I can remember. Yes, but crucially, Scott, this one's based on hydrogen and therefore gas masks don't work. Um, <laughs> Probably best not to think too much about that sort of thing, <laughs> Sensing that this must be the work of Ares, and them being supposed to stop them in that, Diana defies her mother Hippolyta, Connie Nielsen, to head off to our world to stop this nonsense by finding Ares and killing him, reasoning that he's most likely found at the heart of all this strife. Meanwhile, the Allies, largely represented by kindly old Sir Patrick, David Thewlis, are too busy talking about an armistice to countenance doing anything about this threat, at least openly. So a small slush fund is discreetly opened to provide Steve Trevor, Frank Collin, and Diana the means to hire a small team of specialists. Spy Samir, Said Tagmaoui, Marksman Charlie, Ewan Bremner, and Smuggler Chief Eugene Brave Rock, were all with the aim of breaking through the front lines, tracking down Ludendorff, and stopping his weapons of mass destruction. And so it goes, and I'm sure by this point you've all seen enough comic book movies to imagine how this goes. Patty Jenkins directs Alan Heinberg's script, Heinberg being one of the comic writers for Wonder Woman, and I can only assume that this helped flesh out Diana's character, having so far in the post-Nolan DC universe perhaps the most readily understandable motivations and drives. The whole film indeed takes more of a cue from the earlier Marvel origin stories than anything from the Snyderverse, and while that does make it arguably a much less interesting story, it certainly makes it a far more coherent and accessible one, from the script to the effects to the performances, Wonder Woman is a consistently polished product that clearly has more mass market appeal than any of Snyder's efforts. Millions will no doubt rejoice at that, although as one of the brave few pseudo-defenders of Snyder's reign of terror, I kinda miss the rough edges that's afflicted the DC Universe so far. While Wonder Woman provides proof, if any were really needed, to that skipping the whole Phase 1 origin stories and attempting to drop a complete comic book universe in from the outset was daft. Wonder Woman's refusal to even hint at the broader questions about heroism that Batman vs Superman skirted around without properly addressing uh, still feels a little bit disappointing. But then Suicide Squad didn't do any of that either, and Suicide Squad was also a pile of dung. And this is very much not, so let's be thankful for what small victories we have. Wonder Woman's not perfect, to be sure, but there's no flaw in this film that's not endemic to most origin stories, and most notably the marginalisation of the final villain, condensing that to mostly the final act and coming across as a bit of a rushed CG light show rather than a satisfying climax. Uh, also, the motley crew assembled by Steve Trevor, Bobby and Nigel might as well not be there for what little purpose they serve, and if you've not guessed who's revealed as Ares from the first time that character opens his mouth, I'll be very surprised, but none of that really gets in the way of enjoying the film. It's a very solid turn from Chris Pine, and a better one from Gal Gadot, who provides the strong female lead performance we've been waiting in vain for from Marvel Studios, and its apparent success will hopefully cause the bands of Gamergate oxygen thieves who somehow still have the time and energy to be angry about films with women in them to eat enough crow to choke on it. Yes out of ten. I enjoyed this a great deal. Uh, I don't have a great deal to add to what you said, Scott. Yes, it's lacking a little in the issues of heroism, and it does touch them a bit, except that the character refuses to accept them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's no thing else is giving anything away. There's a scene where they are in trenches in World War One. They're heading towards their objective, and Chris Pine's trying to explain. Well, no, we, we can't save everyone. We're, we're trying to get to this place. The war's horrible. Some people are going to die. We're going to try and stop the most people dying, and she won't accept <laughs> that. And so there, are, like, there's some interesting bits there that maybe they could have done something more, but. It's more like, no, I, I'm magic and I will yeah. just do this anyway, <laughs> yeah. which is a little disappointing. Um, but I suppose it's fair enough if you are actually magic and can yes, do it. I so. suppose so, yes. Yeah, <laughs> she is capable of doing something. Um, <laughs> I'd read a quote from the director, Patty Jenkins, about people saying that the film was really kind of cheesy because the character was so sincere and honest and kind of really, I don't know what was the word, really believed, I guess, mm. in what she was doing and so I was expecting something like much heavier in that regard and it's like well no the the character just seems to care and, yeah. which is nice um, <laughs> I, and so it sets it apart because the character has no cynicism um, yeah. well, by the end of the film she has cynicism 
the, the way the film is framed. That lack of cynicism is refreshing and the character is just earnest and cares. But it's not like cheesy or sentimental in the way that that quote would make you think it was. Yeah. So I don't know where that came from, but yeah, so that's quite nice that the, the character is. I mean, she's naive, obviously, and talking naively, some of the fish out of water stuff is quite entertaining. But otherwise, it's just, it's a, it's a superhero film. It has a lot of the same things you'd get in all of them. Hmm. And certainly the the villain is massively underwritten. Um, yeah. Though the the biggest issue I have that is a, an endemic problem to superhero films is that for me this is probably four fifths of a really good film, and then in the end it's just a monster fight. Yeah. Stop it. The DC films of late seem to have been particularly bad about that. Yeah. Because uh, Man of Steel was a monster fight at the end. Dawn of Justice was a monster fight at the end. I can't remember how Suicide Squad ended, but I'm going to guess it was a monster fight at the end. I, I honestly can't remember how that film finished. Um, Presumably, yeah. yeah. Doctor Strange was a monster fight at the end. Doctor Strange I at least appreciated because it wasn't actually a fight. He just annoyed yeah, the big bad, was, didn't he? It was a trick, <laughs> um, go, I guess, yeah. which, yes, which would be, but still it's, uh, yeah, it comes to end. And it's not, it's not even so much that it's CG because, I mean, at least there were some slightly different looking elements in it. It didn't look quite like a lot of other things. But at the same point, same time, it's not just like, oh, it's just a monster fight at the end. And could you do something different? You know, it's... And, and I have other minor issues. Some of the the digital doubles looked surprisingly dodgy for 2017. Um, they were verging to video game at times. And the actual shots when it's clearly the genuine actor, it were much more appealing than the, the bits when it looked like, oh, this is just... Um, pixels flying about and I, I'm not interested the movement was a bit wrong I was going to say that's a minor quibble but then again it's 2017 um, and the technology and the ability has come on so much that I, maybe that's not actually forgivable now um, yeah, it's, it's not like this is a small indie film or anything is it? Yeah it's, it, so, it's not It's not when it's EG effects done in like four Amigas with video toasters networked together or anything is it? So, yeah. Oh. yeah there were, there were a couple just thinking about it there were a couple of ragged bits the whole end section looks incredibly fake, but there's no for the for the style they decided yeah, to have. Uh, uh, there's no uh, there's no way around that. Um, yeah, but the there's a scene with Diana as a child that is some really really horrendous rear projection or blue screening that it looks it's verging on as bad as Frank Nitti being thrown off the roof in the Untouchables. <laughs> it's that level of dodgy, and it, so it, that stuck it like a sore thumb. But yeah, there are some digital double moments that look really dodgy. Other than that, though, yeah, the characters are likeable. Gal Gadot, who, Dawn of Justice aside, I think I only really know from one and or more of the Fast and Furious films, which are not strong character films. <laughs> and she wasn't even part of anybody's family, so obviously she wasn't getting much <laughs> to do in those. Yeah, she's pretty likeable. She has some fairly decent comic chops, I would say. And she likes the good combination of her facial expression and her time seems to make a lot of the lines work quite well Chris mm. Pine I've always liked I think he's he's pretty agreeable to watch so yeah it's an entertaining film and, and judging by the standards of of comic book films yes it's very entertaining I kind of wish they would do something different with the way they end these things yeah I can't think of a clever ending to a comic book movie yet yeah and no, I mean I don't think this was fudge in film I think it must have seen back in our one liner days Scott but the end of Iron Man 3, we like, we like, was quite inventive because the the character was mostly out of the suits. It wasn't just all CGI stuff. It was still largely a monster fight, though. Yeah. Iron Man 1 was a monster fight. Iron Man 2 was a monster fight. Captain America Civil War wasn't a monster fight, but it was just CGI people hitting other CGI people at the end. And I'm pretty sure all of the Spider-Man films have been monster fights at the end, more or less. Mm. And it's it's really boring. It's it's so difficult not to simply switch off when you get to the end of these films now. Most of the X-Men films... I mean, the X-Men films actually fare a little better. Uh, maybe the only recent ones in actual monster fight is probably um, Apocalypse. Yeah. Uh, because even when you're fighting Jean Grey or the Dark Phoenix in X-Men 3, not really a monster fight in the same way. So maybe they fare a little better, but the bulk of them do seem to come down to monster fights. I think Logan probably gets away with it. That's not really a monster fight. It's just yeah. It's also that. the one that feels least like a comic yeah. book film too. It's, yeah, it's the, the first true. one did something interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess probably Winter Soldier 
isn't so much like a, a monster fight then. But yes, you know um, that I that largely yes they are, and it's, I just want them to try in something a bit more inventive than that at the end, mm-hmm. especially because I mean the most egregious one is Dawn of Justice because the film ended and then they added a monster fight. Yeah, so mm-hmm. you had Batman fighting Superman. It didn't need anything else, let alone another thirty to forty minutes of a monster fight. It's even in the title. Come on. Yeah, Batman versus Superman. Yes. So they've been so determined to have monster fights, they artificially add them unnecessarily make the film um, the extended cut of which is three hours. Yeah. Um, thanks, Zack Snyder. Yeah. So, yes, it's it's a trend that I do not like. It's not even so much a trend, it's more it's like a, a staple, I think. And I want it to go away. Yeah. <laughs> Hoping the next Batman film doesn't end with a big monster fight. Yeah. Still though, Wonder Woman's good. Don't, yeah. um, don't get me wrong on that. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I just wish it had not followed the template of everything else yeah. quite so closely. Credit to uh, Patty Jenkins, I guess. Did quite a good job of directing such a you know, big budget action film and it's not really got a track record that would have you expecting something like that. I mean, the only thing I've think, really seen from her was back in 2003 with Monster, which was very much not a comic book movie. Mm-hmm. So, what was that film about? That's the you know it's the one that Charlie's Throne was hailed as being oh, brave for because right, she was yes, playing an right. ugly woman. <laughs> so, come on. Yeah, she played the Alien Wernos. <laughs> yeah. So I have seen that because the only thing I could think of there, and I knew it wasn't, but um, I was like, I could only remember Monsters Ball, and I'm thinking that's not good because that film's no. terrible. And Halle Berry got an Oscar for reasons I don't know because it wasn't acting because she can't do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, yes, Monster. Yeah, that was a good film, a good performance, but that's quite a difference from. Yeah, it's just a slightly different tone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of slightly different tones, I guess that brings us to a dog's purpose. Yeah. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, yes. Um, a dog's purpose, or possibly better, look who's barking, is. Yes, I'm sure there will be people who remember those terrible films from the 1980s. <laughs> it's not a lost reference, I hope. <laughs> oh well, there actually was one about dogs and cats, wasn't there? I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it was Luke who's talking, Luke who's talking to, and maybe Luke who's talking now. Was that the animal one? Something that sounds like about that. right. Yeah. That's so strange. Remember when those were made? Yeah, Bruce Willis is a star now, so that's not so strange. But back then, Roseanne Barr or Arnold or whatever she was at that point, she was a big star. That was strange. <laughs> yeah, ask yeah. your grandparents, folks, if you have no idea who Roseanne was. Oh, the best about Roseanne was launching John Goodman into a great film career. So we'll be grateful for that. Mm. <laughs> Yes. So, look who's barking then. It's the tale of a reincarnating dog, voiced by Josh Gad, who we first meet in the 1960s as Bailey, a red retriever, who becomes the best friend of a troubled kid called Ethan, with an alcoholic father. The dog helps him find... whatever. (laughs) And realise... something? Probably. Then it dies. And immediately comes back as another dog with the same maternal voice, which then dies. People love dogs, and the idea of having a film centred on a dog isn't necessarily bad. Marley and Me may be Hallmark-level sentimental gooey schlock, but it's at least entertaining, fuzzy and warm feeling Hallmark-level sentimental gooey schlock. But there is something so calculated and manipulative feeling about a dog's purpose. One dog good, so more dogs better. Sadly, to get all of those extra dogs necessarily requires lots of doggy death. And while it's not quite a tonal mess, it is a tonal failure. After first Doug, the rest of the animals aren't given sufficient time to have a story, and for the audience to attach any significance to each subsequent canine death, director Lassie Hullstrom and the five screenwriters are clearly relying on an audience reflex of Oh, dead dog. Sad. Sad dead dog. Dead dog sad to make up for the deficiencies in the film. And there are deficiencies ahoy. In their haste to make Ethan's dad an alcoholic so he can feel sympathy for the son and poor, unfairly treated Bailey, they seem to have glossed over the fact that the reason the father became a full blown alcoholic was because he lost his job more or less directly as a result of something that the dog did. Then there's the fact that in one of its next lives, Bailey is some kind of super dog. Tracking a suspect from the backseat of a car travelling at 40 miles per hour, which is totally how police dogs work, right? It's also tremendously banal, 
and that's before Dennis Quaid turns up in the final act. Much of this is due to the fact that it doesn't have many ideas, and those it does have are repeated over and over. Oh ho, the dog acts like it knows what the human is thinking. I think you know what I am thinking, says human to dog. Rinse and repeat. And Josh Gad's voiceover, his performance is fine, just wasted, gives the dog a sense of intelligence and purpose that never meshes with the action being narrated. Because, well, mate, it's a dog. It just wants to chew the arse out of that football. Its other oft-repeated idea is the dog repeatedly confusing human and dog behaviour. My sides, aidez moi accompanied by some absolutely honking dialogue. Humans are complicated. They do things dogs just can't understand, like leave. Shudder. It's all so twee and try-hard. And then, having run out of ideas entirely, the final act is just a solo homeward bound The Incredible Journey. At the end, I still don't know what the dog's purpose is, unless somehow it's to wait 50 years and then play matchmaker. Nice dogs, 11 out of 10 for fluffy ears and tail chasing. And the hidden cat joke is genuinely funny. Everything else is absolute tosh though. Just as an addendum, if you want to watch a film about a reincarnated dog being reunited with his former master, then I urge you, nay demand of you, that you watch the deeply entertaining Dean Spanley, with the excellent and sorely missed Peter O'Toole, and a career best performance from Sam Neill as a vicar imagining that he is a dog. If you just want to see some lovely dogs, then there's this little thing called YouTube. Just avoid the footage that surfaced from the production of a dog's purpose showing a terrified German shepherd being forced to enter water for the purposes of our entertainment. And if you want to watch a Dennis Quaid film, then I'm sorry, there's very little that I can do for you, but I'm sure there are counselling services available in your area. So this is one of the films that you would actually be gratified if it turned into a massive monster battle with Dennis Quaid getting squashed. <laughs> You're like it just to become a giant dog like Digby. That old <laughs> Jim work. Dale Disney film. <laughs> uh, I did watch this. Oh goodness gracious why. I'm sorry Scott, why did you do that? I should have pod- warned you off of it. It's for the podcast. I mean, obviously it's not a film for the hipster the edgelords amongst us. But I, I couldn't really bring myself to, to be angry about the film. It's clearly got a purpose in mind of being a film that says, I would like to show you some dogs. And then it shows you some dogs. And then it, that seems to be the contract that it has with the audience. And I think it fulfills that. But there's very little to be engaged by it other than going, that's a pretty dog. So you'd probably be better off just following the We Rate Dogs Twitter account for the most part. Um, <laughs> certainly couldn't recommend it to, to anyone, but it's not... I didn't find it offensive in the way that you did. I couldn't, didn't find it quite so calculated and horrific, but it's, it doesn't really have much purpose or point or <laughs> any reason to recommend it. So, yes, mm. no out of ten. <laughs> yes, it's... to repeat my point. Though. And if you just wanted to see some lovely dogs, then YouTube is full of it. Yeah, you know, and there have been dog films over the years. And Lassie House himself did yeah, uh, Hatchy, a dog yeah. story, which, which is actually is, quite good. I, I quite like that. Yeah, it's a good for, story. Even for a Richard Gere film, you know, it's at the very least passable. It's quite entertaining, and crucially, it does kind of follow the dog, you yeah. know, through a story. And and the the film is like Marley and Me, you know, it's kind of sentimental, schmaltzy nonsense, but it's still kind of nice. And if you like dogs, I think you'll like that. It's, it's not a demanding watch by any means. And then there are um, slightly less upbeat dog films like Old Jell or Cujo. <laughs> uh, you know, there, there are dog films out there of various types, but this one is just really cynical attempt just to go, here are some dogs. And I don't <laughs> see what the point of that is nowadays when so much video material is so readily available. Yeah. So then, we're going to move into space next then, I believe, Scott. Yes, a couple of catch-up science fiction efforts. Uh, first of which will be Life, which came out this, towards the start of this year. A crew on board the International Space Station is set up to receive a probe from Mars, which has collected some samples, and they're about to go all science on that biatch. As part of this, they find that 
they've proven that there is life outside of Earth when they discover a, an unusually large single-celled organism as part of their samples, and in their course of playing with it and studying it, this then starts to grow, and uh, having resurrected it or revived it, it starts growing at a tremendous pace uh, and also seems to be getting ever more intelligent. And very soon, not, it not only is it uh, started attacking the members of the spacecraft, it's also breached its isolation uh, while eating and growing from the organic mass, presumably, that, uh, that it takes from the uh, crew members and is becoming a danger to everyone on board. And then they must, of course, try and save both themselves and the planet Earth by containing and or destroying this menace. Halfway decent cast for this. Um, Hiroku Sanada, Ryan Reynolds, Rebecca Ferguson, Jake Gyllenhaal. Oh God. Hold on. Halfway decent Hiroku. cast and you mentioned Ryan Reynolds near the start of that. No, no, Scott. It's just, it's just but, out of the list. Yeah, it's not awful in this. Uh, my only concern with Ryan Reynolds in this is that he's, because he, and apologies for the spoilers, because he doesn't last very long in it, They've obviously tried to go, right, you just, just get all your personality up front and try and condense it into about five minutes. So he's obviously the, the, the zany, <laughs> shouty guy for a lot of it. And then he dies, which, to be honest, I'm quite welcomed. Um, <laughs> I think there's something interesting in the first five, ten, fifteen minutes or so of life when they're actually just, when everything's at a small scale and they're just kind of wondering exactly what this thing is and they're, they're kind of poking and prodding at it and they have a, a chance to maybe ask a few questions about what life outside Mars means. Not many, but at least it's it's going for something like that. And then very soon afterwards, it just becomes 60 minutes of B-movie schlock, where an alien that looks like a jellyfish is wandering around eating people, and it very soon gets pretty boring. It's the sort of alien gets on board a space station movie that we've seen about a million times before. This has more budget than most of them put together, mind you, but it's still the same story and not really all that effectively told. And it has an ending that made me quite angry indeed uh, without getting into spoilers. Let's just say that's not how astrophysics works in these kind of collisions. Hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't really enjoy this at all. It's not bad in the kind of traditional sense, but I couldn't find anything in there to latch on to engage with. Most of the characters are quite annoying. Jake Gyllenhaal does his best, bless him, but even he's, as perhaps the most interesting character, can't really carry anything like the amount of weight that is put upon him in this film. And yes, the ending is abysmal, so hmm, not, yes. not not good. <laughs> yes. I thought this was okay, but so much of it felt kind of generic, or at least so much of it in different parts reminded me of other films, like yeah. it just being kind of cobbled together from other ideas. You're talking about the astrophysics in particular too, and what that made me think so much of was gravity, mm. which everybody praised at the time as being like really realistic. And have you considered basic Newtonian physics? It's, yeah. Gravity wasn't very realistic, and also in space, everything isn't next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> at least that doesn't. This film doesn't go down that road. But there's certain there's bits in the way that the begins in some ways reminded me of gravity too, in the way it kind of spiraled out of control after that. Hmm. Um, I mean, there are there are moments where they've put some thought into it. And I'm like, yes, finally, where these people to be in this job, you have to be professional. And people go through all this psychological testing and stuff. Hmm. And when Ryan Reynolds gets, um, Reynolds gets trapped in a laboratory with this creature, and the the woman that's in Mission Impossible Four, whose name I've forgotten, but yes, that woman, Rebecca Ferguson. That sounds a bit right. Yeah. I think that's her. She's in one of the Mission Impossible films anyway. Uh, she says, I can't let you out. And instead of like being like, for instance, the absolute cretins that were written in Alien Covenant, <laughs> he goes, yeah, okay, I accept that. I understand how that's got to work. That's the whole point of this. I'm a professional. Yeah. So having <laughs> Ryan Mel's character do that, genuinely refreshing. It doesn't follow through completely because some of the things that the original scientists did were a bit stupid. Yeah. So it kind of under really undermined that, but so instead of yeah, the morons in Alien Covenant who didn't bother to do even the most basic of quarantine principles um, or practices at all, or I particularly pay hate of mine, Matthew McConaughey in um, everything. In, well, in Interstellar though, who's oh. supposed to be this great Air Force pilot, and like you don't get to be an astronaut and get to do those jobs without having psychological testing and the discipline and stuff, and he more or less loses. His 
after about three and a half minutes in space. <laughs> he starts um, forgetting to do the things that a person in his job should be doing. He starts wailing about his daughter instead. So the fact that they actually they wrote the characters a bit differently um, and had them be sensible in this film, genuinely refreshing. And then they seem to, at that point, stop writing the characters and they're just, they're just people that are there on screen. Uh, what this film obviously was sorely lacking was a barrier building scene. Yes. <laughs> this film needed a barrier building sequence very much and that would have kept the beastie out. The writers didn't seem to know what they were doing with the, the beastie. Um, because, yes, they said it was intelligent and also at one point that its cells were like capable of being everything. Hmm. It was eye and muscle and something else. I don't know whether they meant that was stem cells or something, but later on they definitely gave the thing eyes, so... I, yeah. I, I admit my attention did wander a bit there, so I may have just slightly misunderstood exactly how they meant that. But then they have this creature, and it's like, okay, they're suggesting it's feeding on these people, okay. But then it, it didn't actually feed on anybody at any point for more than maybe a second and yeah. eat a wee bit of their leg, and then go, go around to kill everybody. Well, so is this a thing, a creature that's trying to survive, or have, has it just become a monster film or stalker film? You know, it was very mixed and yes so it reminded me of so many other films too a little bit of sunshine which uh, not that to compare it particularly well because sunshine's a great film up until the end when it turns into a slasher film and kind of ruins it and then it made me think of in parts of the andromeda effect andromeda strain sorry Hmm. and then yeah gravity as i mentioned it's just the whole thing though was just a bit meh and then the final 10 minutes i just hated with a passion there's a twist ending in this film and if you can't guess what the twist ending is going to be you've apparently never seen any film before ever or you might have just expected physics to work the way that physics actually works rather than yes. what they show in this one but anyway yeah i not even just like the physics ignore the actual practical things that lead to the ending yeah. i know with 100 percent certainty how this film is going to turn out yeah. Get to the end of the film. Yes, that is how the film turned out. Obviously, <laughs> it wasn't going to be any other way. It's kind of an interesting idea. And, and the fact that some thought in some way was applied to it to set it apart from so many of the, the conventions you tend to get in this sort of film. And then just absolutely squandered. Mm-hmm. It, it didn't help that nobody really has given a character. I think that if you'd cared about anybody in the film, it would have gone a long way. Yeah. No, and no barrier building sequence, Scott, so I am disappointed. Yeah, so I guess that takes us to our other big budget, glossy science fiction nonsense, um, old last year's Passengers, uh, in which you see colonising spaceship travelling from Earth to somewhere far, far away. And after some unexpected detour through uh, an asteroid field that batters up some of the ship's system, one and one alone hibernation pod opens up. One featuring Jim Preston, played by Chris, one of them, Pratt maybe? (laughs) Why not? Basically, he wakes up with no one around and a a ship more or less entirely deserted apart from one robotic barman, Michael Sheen, um, Arthur. And after trying pretty much everything he can to try and get himself back into hibernation, the ship is so far away that they can't communicate with Earth and get a response back at any time before he's going to die of old age. He, yes, isn't it? It's going to take like 40 years to get a reply or something. Yeah, <laughs> of course, being alone for so long it affects his sanity somewhat, but uh, at some point he fixates on a fellow passenger, one still asleep, Aurora Lane, played by Jennifer Lawrence, and one day he makes the fateful decision to actually wake her up by deliberately sabotaging her hibernation pod. Yes, After, because he is a murderer. Yes, because he is the worst person. But we're not supposed to think about that too deeply because the two then start off a love story. Until, of course, eventually. I know, I'm not quite sure if Arthur was supposed to let this slip um, just accidentally or if it was deliberate. I think it was deliberate. Aurora discovers that uh, Jim Preston gave her this life sentence of being marooned in an empty spaceship with him. And uh, understandably, no, it doesn't take, doesn't take too kindly to that. Yes, she's a bit pissed. Yes, but thankfully you don't have to worry about that too much because before anything particularly deep or meaningful can happen about the same why she, she's been murdered by this guy, it turns out the ship's really actually failing badly, but out of nowhere, Lawrence Fishburne's deck crew something or other um, of, of some nature, Gus Mancuso, is awoken 
uh, in a very badly beaten up state due to malfunctioning pod and th th with this access to the areas of the ship previously denied to them because they was a, they're not members of the crew, they work out that the ship's in very serious peril indeed and they must come together to save the ship before everyone dies. And, well, that's, that's basically it in a nutshell. This is another one of these movies, it's a lot like life in, in as much as it feels like. This is the sort of B movie that in days gone by someone would have put two or three million and done on a pretty small scale and it would be the kind of thing that would have some interesting ideas and would probably become some kind of slight cult classic like, I don't know, Silent Running or something like that. Instead, what's happened is they pumped over a million dollars into making this thing so it does admittedly look really quite spectacular. That doesn't sound like very much. Sorry, a hundred million. <laughs> yeah, that makes more sense now. <laughs> yeah, put a, put a hundred million into this film and... It, to be fair, with, I think four, with four cast members, I reckon there's some big paychecks going on there. Yeah, um, the that, I think I think a lot of that shows up on screen. It does look quite pretty in a lot of places, but there's no much of a story here at all, and the characters are not that interesting, and it just can't possibly carry this amount of expectation on it. It's, it's not a particularly great film, and the attempts to make it feel more epic in scale actually kind of diminishes it in, in the way, especially the fact that it never really goes into any depth about any of Jim's decision to wake uh, Aurora up, which is ethically just, well, I mean, obviously wrong, but you could at least have discussed it in some points. And Aurora's reaction is, you know, perfectly understandable, but it really should have explored all of that dynamic much more than just going on to the light show at the end, which is what happened. Yeah, and, it, yeah, it should be it should be a character piece and perhaps some sort of psychological case study. Yes. Because because if you do that, then his actions, while still reprehensible, yeah. at we least need... become understandable. Yeah. Because and... solitude does... It's why solitude is used as a punishment. It does things to people. Humans are social beings. Yeah. And they need to be around other people. So you are on your own for a long time, realise that you're going to die alone. If they'd actually explored that, perhaps they explored his declining mental state, something like that, mm. then I that could be genuinely interesting. They make a half-hearted attempt to do it for about five minutes, which yeah. is not really anything like long enough. It's like all the bits of where they're actually asking anything like an, an interesting question are just rushed through to get to the next sort of CG budget splurge. Because yeah. um, it, it, it does get to the point where he's on the verge of committing suicide, and that kind of prompts this uh, the, the desperate act. But that is just rushed into and rushed right out of again, and it's never really explained, uh, well, never really explored in anything like the depth that we need to, to actually yeah. have this guy remain uh, a sympathetic character, or at least a, yeah. a relatable character. And yeah, and then he just becomes a monster, so... It's not the first time where, and I, I generally don't think enough people think about this film in this way, uh, it's not a fact. Obviously, the, the subject matter is completely different, but it made me think very much of the first Thor film, because in the first Thor film, He's a murderer. I hate the first Thor film. It, it, it's always bothered me, and I'd never understood why more people weren't bothered by it. The film starts off mm. with Thor, because he's basically like a rebellious teenager, wandering off to someone else's planet and killing a bunch of people. It's like, well, it's okay, because they're not human. They don't look, they're not the same colour as you, so it's okay. But no, that, that makes the star of your film a murderer. The star of Passengers is basically a murderer. So yes, as we said, if you make it psychological, if you focus on the so his personality basically falling apart, that sort of thing, desperation, then what he does is wrong, but understandable. And this film just doesn't care. Yeah. Maybe it feels like actually the writers generally don't think that he did a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, well, no, he's taken some... And, and it doesn't really matter that you know, the, the everybody's going to die later if because of the problem with the ship that they have to focus on. It's he doesn't know that. Yeah. No way to know that. As far as he's aware, everything's okay. He's a murderer, but I, I guess we're supposed to think that it's perfectly okay because they're two very pretty people, and then they end. They have a relationship, so that justifies everything. <laughs> and there, that by the end of this film, I was furious because I, was, I don't want to uh, spoil the end of it. But it's by the end of this, I was furious because there's no, there's no, basically no punishment for what he's done, and it's a really kind of disturbing message to to mm. have in there so yeah that really bothered me but pretty people who um well will also in the film they're going to fall in love because they're pretty people and, yeah. and then it's okay for pretty people to do whatever they want because they're pretty people <laughs> yeah 
History's kind of, greatest monsters. Yeah. The pretty people. It, it's kind of it's quite an empty film. Unnecessarily so, and that's the and that's okay. And it's just it feels like a waste of opportunity because if you have Chris Pratt kind of basically losing his mind uh, talking to Michael Sheen's robotic bartender and stuff for a lot of time, and there's there's the seed of a decent, interesting idea in there, but in the end, they just abandon it. Do not like that film. No, 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 no. <laughs> yes, yeah, so two sci fi clunkers to round out this podcast, I think. Uh, Yes, well, we go to the Twitter then, Scott. Yes, why not? Again, thanks for, for your feedback. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash fudsandfilm. Please keep uh, your feedback coming in. It's nice. We like to have discussions about things too. And we will begin with Perpetual Dumb Machine at Blake Wrights on Twitter, who says, All of a dog's purpose is vile to me from its concept on up. So I think he's uh, feeling more like I do than you do about it, Scott. <laughs> Wonder Woman was decent. Which on a DC curve is great. Backloaded villains less great. Yes, we both agree with that. The the villain is underwritten. Palpatine. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the purpose of that question. If if you want an, an answer to Palpatine, I'm not sure what the what either the question or the answer is. So yes, I don't know. Um, because in the original <laughs> Star Wars trilogy, Palpatine wasn't really backloaded because he was mentioned in Star Wars, and then they just they developed him later. But I don't know. Um, but Palpatine. Maybe. <laughs> and a few in from at Sonic Yoda on Twitter. Hello again. Um, life was weird. A decent set of characters that I didn't forget instantly, but marred by genre familiarities and a stupid lead scientist. Yes, very much so. He adored Wonder Woman. Finally a DC film with some genuine humour to go with its action onslaught, which makes all the difference. I just agree with that too. Passengers is probably the most offended he's been by a movie's message. Being a stalker slash sentencing to someone to death is fine if you're lonely. Yes, that is. <laughs> Clearly, he had the same issues with the film as I did. Yes. <laughs> Going back to Wonder Woman, that is, um, it helps that the writing and the characters in Wonder Woman were good as well, obviously. Perhaps the first time I've enjoyed a DC film since Dark Knight. Yes, I think you and I are largely alone, Scott, in liking Dawn of Justice. Everybody else seems to hate it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but foolishly, they seem to think Civil War was good, despite the fact <laughs> this is not true. Yeah. I, I, I do like Batman vs Superman, but it, it does need a lot of caveats around it as well. Uh, I can, t- to be fair, I understand why a lot of people don't like it, but at least I appreciate what it is trying to do on a number of levels. But yes, I've not yet gone back and watched the director's cut because, as you mentioned, I think that really, need, that really needed the director's cut to have axed about three quarters of an hour out of it rather than add things to it. So. Yes, it basically, if the film stops after Batman and Superman fight, then that is fine. And, you know, basically, they, they go and catch Lex Luthor after that. Um, but yes, it's. I mean, and I don't know what the extra material is in the director's cut, but I just suspect it's mostly going to be in the monster fight at the end. Whoopee. Uh, <laughs> so I guess that's the end of it for now. As you said, please keep any feedback coming. Twitter's probably the best place at Fuds on Film. We're also on Facebook, facebook.com slash Fuds on Film, or you can email us podcast at Fuds on Film. And that will wrap us up for today, but we'll be back fairly soon. And until then, just take care of yourself and each other. So it's goodbye from me, and it's a goodbye from him. Adios. Adios.